there are still 10 people who are not assigned to a breakout session, but I would say we start. Um, so first of all, um, Juli, I would like to know how to pronounce your name, because I'm a bit confused. It de depends. <laughs> okay. You can just say, well, in German it would be Julia, but I'm used to people calling me Julie, so whatever is fine. <laughs> okay, uh, so I would uh, first introduce our uh, two, uh, two guests. So, um, yeah, Julia is a Julia professor at the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena, uh, also here in Germany, and uh, she started her scientific career with green algae in her bachelor thesis and her PhD. And since 2017, she's working on cyan bacteria. And if I understood it correctly, since 2020, you are junior professor for synthetic biology of phototrophic organisms. Okay, good. And uh, Nick is a um, postdoc in Ilka's lab, and he made his undergrad in Düsseldorf. Then if I learned correctly from René, you made a larger internship in Michigan. Um, then your PhD in Ilka's lab, and now your postdoc there, and I found in your pub publication list a lot of work on circadian clock in CR bacteria. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, I studied in Michigan State. Uh, so. yeah. Great. Good. So, um, I think you prepared something you want to present. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like I have a couple of slides just to begin with, and um, I think then Julie and I will basically uh, make it a little bit more open and, and just like try to have like a Q and A session, basically of like what you have for questions. Um, let me just check if I can share the slides. Can you see the slides now? Okay, cool. Um, so I mean. Um, we are also on one side presenting some bacteria here, but um, we've been working on a couple of different things currently. And and one thing I'm I'm working on for a couple of years already now. Oh, there's a quick. Hmm? I don't know the comment in the uh, in the chat. Sorry. Um, I got the idea is like build also like some kind of, of community for cyanobacterial researchers and um, and um, yeah just who and who am I it's like Paul also introduced me so I'm Nick I, I'm actually a computational biologist so I don't actually work in the lab I just only do computation stuff um, postdoc in Düsseldorf but currently also at the University of Bristol and um, I'm mainly focusing on diversity and evolution of cyanobacteria. Um, I did circadian clockwork, but now more into cellulose and biofilms. And uh, one thing that is pretty awesome is for in iGEM, for example, iGEM is a really great community. And, and what, what the team Bielefeld and team Marburg are currently doing is, is so valuable for all the teams working for photos because it, it basically increases your speed of, of answering questions and, and, and like helping with problems because as a community can just like exchange information much much faster and you don't have to like search for people that might help you and um, um, a bad community would be something that is really exclusive so you have to be like a member of something pay for the membership um, and and this is something that that for, for I, like iGEM or, or CERN as, as the as a research community, they don't do it. Like they they are basically inclusive, but I mean, still those those exclusive communities where you pay for membership or be like in some kind of, of club or so, they're still valuable because they have the same the same values of, of sharing and helping each other, and um, and we encountered that for cyanobacteria. Um, I was organizing a, a, a conference for cyanobacteria research for young cyanobacteria researchers in in twenty seventeen. And, and we didn't have any mailing list. There was no real like community feeling by then. It was just like four years ago. And we basically relied on on the context that Ilka and the, the PI of, of uh, the colleague of mine had uh, to just advertise the conference. And, and um, if you think about it, this is like a shitty situation to advertise your, your information, but 
I mean, we hadn't, we didn't really have to advertise anything. It was like the conference is nothing really important, basically. But think about people that actually have a research problem. It's like having a question, need to get answers or help, and they don't have a network to to fall back on. And um, and our idea was then, like, okay, we need to change this. Like, there need to be some kind of community to to help each other. Uh, because otherwise we'd basically be redoing everything on our own and learning the stuff some people already knew. Um, yeah, and that's what we're doing. It's like basically we're trying to have a community for those that don't have one, early career researchers, people that are new in the field, it's like coming from a different situation and then try to connect those small communities. And um, our idea is to then build tools, create databases. So um, create those standards that also have been already like introduced by, by the uh, Marburg and, and Bielefeld team to like have a, a handbook or something like this. Um, this is so valuable. Basically building like an, a, a social platform. And um, how we envision it, we have like a, a Twitter channel and a YouTube channel which is like the, the first start. Um, we have an open access platform. Um, I, I think some of you might know Protocols IO um, already. Um, but it's like it's an open access platform where you find research protocols for working with cyanobacteria, but anything basically. Anyone can share their protocol over there. So if you have, um, so you'll be able to find protocols there. And it's always good if you develop new protocols or you write down protocols, you can also upload this um, basically for your for your agent work there. Um, now our idea is to just like first select or collect a lot of protocols there and then basically look for similarities or uh, uh, differences and then try to agree on some kind of standards which is really hard i mean you, i will see talked about this in, in a couple of minutes just how diverse cyanobacteria stuff is actually uh, and it's a, it's a really big problem um and then it's basically the idea is like have some kind of, of social platform where everyone can share ideas try to establish collaboration and discuss problems and all that. Um, what we're currently doing is just sharing news and research paper from the community on our Twitter channel. Um, it's just like, it's a lot of work that we just do on the site um, and no one pays us for it um, or so. So like maintaining this is also kind of, uh, it's a lot of work actually. Um, and now what, we, what we're gonna do in the near future is to build a new database. We have. We have different smaller databases available for cyanobacteria, and most of them are outdated, haven't been updated in years. Some of them are even offline, so they are not no longer available to the community because there's, there are no people and no money funding the project. And we're just trying to bring all back all this information and basically bring everything together in one platform, though it's, it's much more accessible the information. Um, so what can we offer you for your for your work in in, in iGEM this year, so um, we currently um, what you can do is basically you can use our our community reach in the community to get help. So if you have any problem, any question, anything, um, just just tweet about it, tag us in there, and um, and we'll just retweet it. Make sure to connect you to people if we know them. Um, that might be that might be useful. I mean, that's the easiest way to just find people. Um, we currently have like 840 cyanobacteria researchers on there. Um, so, and, and a lot of, of synthetic biologists as well. And, and, um, they are, they're actually quite active. So, um, there should be, we, we should be able to find someone that, that can help you with this problem or at least, uh, uh yeah, at least help you a little bit. Um, we have a YouTube channel, subscribe. Uh, we just currently have like 180 subscribers or so, I don't know. Uh, they were just kidding. Um, we have, I think, currently like, like 10 hours, 12 hours of videos there uh, for cyanobacteria research and uh, like molecular biology, everything you, you want to have. So that's like a great resource to just get started with, uh, which is like learn about cyanobacteria because usually I, I never learned about cyanobacteria in my studies. It's like we, don't, we didn't have any research at the university by the time uh, I studied. Um, and it's like I heard about them. In, in micro, like in microbiology, but I never learned anything in detail about cyanobacteria. And I think uh, for most of the people, cyanobacteria are kind of of, of something new. Um, you only learn about like the ancestor of plants, evolution, 
and it's symbiosis, but that's basically pretty much it. And cyanobacteria are really, really diverse and interesting. Um, you probably going to do some kind of outreach or integrated human practice stuff. Um, you might create videos if you produce videos. Um, just let us know. We'll just put them in, in some kind of playlist. I mean, you can you can either upload them, you create your own YouTube channel, upload it there, and we'll just then uh, basically link it to a different uh, to a different playlist. It's just cool to have more information on there. Um, if you don't want to create a, a YouTube channel, but you want to create videos, um, we can also upload the videos for you. Um, that's also, if you feel like this, it's also not a problem. Um, something that I... I just I have one playlist on the YouTube channel. It's about lab methods for cyanobacteria. There's I think one video in it that the University of uh, I think San Diego, uh, the group from Susan Golden produced or so. And and this playlist, at least to the statistics on YouTube, is the the most clicked playlist on our channel. So everyone is interested in lab videos, clicks on it, only finds one video there, and basically then. I think they, they may be watching the video because it's not from us, but from a, from a different group. I cannot look in the statistics of that video. Um, but if you if you happen to produce, want to produce videos, uh, lab videos of lab protocols of, of how to do stuff in the lab is apparently really of interest to people on YouTube. Um, and as Ika mentioned, we have the uh, we have an online seminar. So. Um, the easiest way is to just sign up for it and, and come to the, to the seminar. It's every two weeks and um, we record the talks, upload them to the YouTube channel. So the, all the videos you see are from previous talks or the summer school we had last year in the summer. And um, there are currently 400 something, I think 450 currently subscribers on our mailing list. So if you have any information, um, yeah, anything you have, like you want to have a, a, you do a survey for, I don't know, something or um, do you have any project or you say you want to um, distribute, just send me an email and I can just put it in the in the mailing list. I send around um, l at least every two weeks as a reminder for the next upcoming seminar information. I can just put in information from, for your project if you're interested in, in taking the reach. And they usually like 70 to 80 people coming to each seminar depending on the talk um because cyanobacteria are so diverse then also the, the the group of people that comes to the seminar is kind of diverse um and it's a great way to learn but you can also ask questions um and, and connect to the community which is which i think is a, is a great thing um here just the the names of the just for the youtube channel if you want to look at it or um, the twitter just to have it uh at hand if you if you might want to use this for outback to get help. Um, so one thing we we decided beginning of the year because um, there are no real standards in, in bio cyanobacteria work, especially, I mean, that's not a big problem if you think about the different research fields we have, but if it comes to molecular biology and especially synthetic biology, it really becomes a problem if there are really different um, ways of, of doing it. So it's not really reproducible and not comparable between the labs. Um, so there are, there's one BG11 medium and it's called the standard BG11 medium. And if you ask the people, they have, every lab has a different way of preparing the medium. There are slightly differences in the recipe of the medium that might not make a difference. It's like, I don't know. And we don't know. Um, but it could be that, that this makes a difference. So what we're doing right now is, um, and there's also no standard on the wild type. So every lab has their own synecosystem strain. It's not that a company sells the strain and everyone has the same one. And if you think about bacteria, they evolve pretty fast. So every time you, you create a new plate, it basically had, there is basically one mutation probably in there. And like every couple of months, if you renew your culture, um, you, you have a new white type strain basically. And um, I know labs that that work on phototaxis, um, so moving to the light or away from the light for cyanobacteria. And their white type, because they always select the the colonies that like are the furthest on the on the plate, their white type is now faster than any fast moving uh, mutants they have in the lab. 
because they always select for the fastest wild type. Every time they take a new sample from the plate, they take it from the from the, fa the fastest position, basically. So it's, it's a lab evolution experiment for a couple of years, and now their wild type is super fast. Um, so so there there probably so many mutations in there compared to other wild types, and that makes it really um, difficult to work or say compare the results. So what we're doing right now. We have nine labs across Europe. Um, and we constructed, we, we decided on a single white type. We got it from the group of um, Filippo Branco dos Santos from Amsterdam. Um, and, and this is the white type we're sending around to all the labs now in Europe, like all the nine labs that are participating in Europe. And we um, created a single BG11 recipe. So every lab is just like required to use the same recipe. We slightly modified the recipe because we have um, a, a copper inducible, I think it's copper, right? I think it's, yeah, it's copper inducible promoter in there. So we had to take the copper out of the medium and have it like as, an, as a, a second substance, basically. And we created um, three different constructs that we are now testing basically on reproducibility in the lab. So every, every we have the one single water that is now transformed with three different constructs. Um, and we're just doing, it's, it's basically just an indu inducible promoter on there with a fluorescence a protein. And then we'll do a plate media experiment just to see if we can compare the results all over Europe. Because you might think that this should be like, that's, they should be the same. They probably will be the same. But um, when you talk to researchers, you, you find that depending on what kind of tap water you use, it's different from Spain to Düsseldorf to the UK because of the, the substances that are in the, simply in the water. Some water has more like calcium carbonate in it. So it's a little bit, as you say, harder than the other waters. Um, and, and this has a different, uh, this makes a difference on, on the, on, of how different substances dissolve in the medium. So basically we're, we're we hope uh, we think it will be the same. We hope it will be the same, um, but we're still doing it to, um, to basically check it. So what we can do is we could um, in the first run we we will test this the construct in in the same white type. But our idea is to how reproducible or comparable are the results if we use different white type strains. So every lab has this, their own synecosystem strain that might be a little bit different uh, between the labs, or can we also use this construct to transform a nostoc strain, a synecococcus elongatus strain or so? That's what, that will be the next step. So basically take the construct, transform as many different cyanobacteria we have in all the different labs. Um, so if you want to have the construct of it, um, yeah, just sh shoot me an email. And I, we probably can send you the plasmid prep um, to your lab. And then if you want to, like, you, you basically just need to grow the strain and have a plate reader at hand to do a fluorescence measurement. Um, that's that's basically it. And we're just basically collecting the data and just be interested in, um, and if that's like if 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 it's actually reproducible, what we're doing. I mean, if it's not, then then the cyanobacterial community, especially the, the synthetic biology community, has a really big problem because if we if we cannot reproduce the most simple experiment by just measuring the same fluorescence. And in, in, with the same wire tap, with the same construct, under the same condition, in just different labs all over in, in Europe, then then none of the papers that is published is is universally uh, basically can be universally used. It's just then a just a snapshot of the specific strain used in this specific lab under this specific condition, but it's not transferable to any any group. Um, and I don't think that will happen, but it, it might. Um, and there are some other projects that, that we just started or some people in the community are interested in or want to do it. And this might be um, projects that, that also could be interesting to you um, or you might want to want to work on this. Um, I, uh, I think three people or so started a Get Started Guide, which is basically, I think it's similar to what the uh, Karlsruhe team did for the, for the Clummy. And I think also what uh, what is now uh, the idea for the for the handbook, uh, if I correct, Paul is right. It's yeah, like, and we have this idea. 
Uh, I mean, yeah. it depends on the community whether people want to contribute, but in the end, we want to have a guide that covers all the aspects how to get started with this organism if you never yeah. work with it. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think having this like as a as a living document, so you have like a Google Doc, and it develops over time because. I mean, get starting with cyanobacteria, you, you probably just start with one cyanobacterium um, and then you add more strains because every strain has a different, it's, you need to handle each strain a little bit differently, but just getting started with cloning and other things. So the handbook would be pretty, pretty awesome. So I was like, I could have like basically take this off the slide, but I still had it on. Um, that might be interesting. It's like, so the handbook is really great. Um, I think one thing that that is still, I don't, I don't think there's a comprehensive list of all synthetic biology tools, parts, kits, um, and like the promoter sequence and all that. So having this basically an Excel sheet of this, um, this might be useful. And I think that might be useful for all teams. So if you basically uh, work on this, and uh, that might be, that, I mean, this useful for you during iGym, but this is, is also really useful to the community. Um, so, so this might be also something um, you'd be interested in. Um, for those that worked with or have like already looked into it a little bit more, there are two cyanobacteria toolboxes, I would say, that they are most prominent. That's like the marble collection. And I think that also works for, for Clummy and, and might be also working for protoplast supplies, basically. And we have, I think, the cyanobacteria um, bio toolbox from uh, Alistair McCormick's lab. Um, they are slightly different, but they are compatible. And one thing that would be really cool to have is like basically one, one toolbox, like where, where everything is in it, um, and they're compatible. They, they the styles are, are similar and all that. Uh, I think that's nothing one team would do, but maybe that's something to to think about or to, as a community uh, want to work on. Um, and if you do biotech production, I think the team from are they here from from Madrid? Um, if I underst understood that right, you're producing bioplastics. I'm, I'm not sure if what it was that you posted on Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. no, actually, we're trying to produce biofuels, but it doesn't oh, yeah. matter. It's just like a, a product from Sanibacteria, for this idea. Yeah, 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 yeah cool. Um, so, so what I think what, what is also now interesting in iGEM is like to have like some kind of, of business plan or something like this. What people don't really calculate, I think that's the biggest bottleneck for cyanobacteria um, biotech production is the cost for, for biomass production. So, so what does it, would it cost to produce a kilogram of cyanobacteria biomass in large scale production? If someone would calculate this, um, this would be amazing because then, then, then you have like a baseline of production cost and then it's, that's, that's always the same on paper you can just like have this as a reference and then it's just simply your cost for the for your yeah for your product um basically and this might vary between different strains different media and different culture conditions um and um another thing is you might do modeling um and there are some genome scale models out there for cyanobacteria um and and different tree equation systems like um ode system they also done um but uh, some people in the in the in the modeling community they're also interested to have like a pun genome model so you have the idea is to take all the like all the pathways that are available in in if you have one combined cyanobacteria cell um have all the pathways together in one model and then basically can select the subset of uh, of of pathways depending on which strain you're working with so um, Nostoc has more, more pathways than Synecosystis, but it's all in there. So you have an idea of what sequences to pick from other one, from other uh, organisms to build like your, your perfect network. Um, yeah, that would be something that, that people haven't currently tackled, but uh, are the mod some of the model people are really interested in that. Um, just to give you um, a short out outlook for BG11 and I have some, we did a, a survey in the community and to give you like a, the diversity aspect of working with cyanobacteria. So BG11 is actually a really, really great medium. It's, it's really well defined. Um, there's nothing in there like, um, like seawater. You just like, 
we usually take mealy pour water. This is like the cleanest water you can get. Um, or you don't have any soil extracts or you don't have like one tablespoon of something as a unit. It's really like grams of, of certain uh, uh, yeah, ingredients. It's, it's well-defined. It's also nothing like the, uh, the um, LB medium where you basically have like yeast as extract in there where you don't know how much of the amino acids are really in there. Uh, if you're working with E. coli, for example. Um, I have a list of, just to give you an idea, um, if you, um, I can also share the slides after that uh, with you. Um, it's, it's probably easier, but I just shorten it if you want to write this up, um, that's also fine. Uh, this is, those are the BG11 mediums, just from the nine groups that participate in the interlab study. Just to give you an idea of, of the differences within labs, you will, you will see that some labs have multiple BG11 media that they use in their lab. Um, and just to give you like a start of, of this, something that would be cool, I think for all of you, if, if you as, as this year's iGEM community for cyanobacteria would agree on one BG11 medium, like all of your groups would use the same medium as with the same recipe, even though your PI says, no, we do it differently in our lab, um, maybe just find a way to, to do it because then at least your, uh, your uh, results within within iGEM this year might be more comparable. Um, and and uh, what we're also doing currently is like analyze every ingredient of the BG11 medium to just find what it does, how compatible it is, for example, for mass spectrometry or any other downstream analytical pipelines. Um, and the idea is to then reduce it to, to really specific uh, compounds and like have some kind of standard um, yeah, I don't, know if, I, I don't know how that would work. Um, yeah, so we did a questionnaire for cultivating cyanobacteria because this was one of the topics for this session is like cultivation and, uh, and, uh, and transformation. And we have like 150 responses from the, from the community. I haven't really analyzed the data, it's just like preliminary. Just to give you an idea, 60% um, of the community is working with cynicocystis, but then other people are working with Mycinicococcus elongatus. Then the UTEX strain, we have Nostoc, we have Microcystis, um, it's like the 14% here, or um, the 7002 as Mycinicococcus. Um, yeah, it's like, it, that, that's fine. It's like, but if you then look at the, how they culture their, uh, their cyanobacteria, a lot of them use a normal Elmire flask with a cotton uh, plug in it, but some covered with tin foil. Then you have groups that use like a, a normal Elmire flask, but it's like the Chicano columns, the, the BEFT ones, they have like small, yeah, I don't know, small things in there. So it's like the mixing is a little bit better. Again, with different pl uh, plugs on, and some use well plates, some grow them directly on a bioreactor or on a multi cultivator with like some smaller tubes. So like all of those have are different culture conditions. And, um, and last slide is light conditions. If you think about this, so 60% use the same strain of, of, of uh, cyanobacteria strain, the same cyanobacteria strain. And if you then look here, like 45% use 50 micromolar, uh, micro Einstein of light. As that means that, that less that even with the single strain in the community, there are different light conditions that they use for culturing their strain. Um, and I haven't, I haven't yet now checked on, on which strain uses which light condition, but just to give an idea, it ranges from 20 micro Einstein to 200 micro Einstein, um, just from the, from the conditions of light people use to normally grow their strains. Temperature, it ranges from 20 degrees to 32 uh, degrees which most people use 30 degrees, but also 28. This is like two degrees. I don't know. It might make, be a diff, make a difference. Shaking, like 40% don't shake their cultures. Uh, like 20% use 100 uh, RPM and 150. Some use bubbling um, to, to mix the cultures. Like they have like small tubes in the culture and then with bubble, bubbling is basically they don't, don't need shaking with the bub bubbles. Yeah, I mean, it, it might make a difference, might not be a make a difference. I don't know. It's just like just observing that there are so many differences in, in, in the community. 
And then CO2, for example. 70% of the people that grow their strains don't use any CO2 supplement. It's like the bubble with normal air, there is CO2 in it. But um, there are also groups that, that supply 1%, 2%, 3% or 5% um, CO2 to it or have like bicarbonate as a, as a carbon concentration um, in there. So, I mean, just looking at this slide is basically growing 60% of the data is from one single strain, if you if you think about the last slide, and it's so diverse. Um, and that makes it really, if, if people write in their, in their message uh, sections, like we use standard culture conditions, like what is standard culture condition? Like what is the standard medium? What is the standard culture condition? And if every one of you would now say, like, uh, we agree on this for this year, on, on those conditions for every lab, that would be amazing because then all of your experiment go in the same direction. Um, yeah, I think that's that's it for me. Um, I think I, I talked to René about it, but he wasn't sure. He was a judge a couple of years before, I think he's, uh, and um, so just working with us at the community or so, this might be cover your gold medal criteria for integrated human practice. Um, we both wasn't, weren't sure about it. Um, I mean, it's always good to have more integrated human practice things, but if you just want to um, want just what, be in touch with us and, and see if, if you want to get involved in the community or so, that might be that might be cover your gold medal criteria. Um, yeah, and that's it basically from, from my side. Oh, I see questions. One raised hand. Yeah. Um, uh, hi. Can <laughs> I start asking questions, or should we? Uh, we... Yeah. Is it, um, I'm not sure, Julie. Do you want to say something about transformation, or do we do it for and cultivation, basically, on question and answer? Well, maybe yeah. it would be good to give people to ask, the chance to ask questions, and then yeah. maybe we can try to to take okay. it from there. Yeah. Uh, I just put because uh, Blanca just asked me. Here's the the link to the seminar list, and there you can can sign up for the. For the mailing list basically you can sign up for the similar and then put you on a mailing list so yeah please uh sorry uh marlene uh, yeah yep. uh, hi i'm marlene from finland and i've been working with seneca sisters now from november actually and now then uh take it as a part of the igem too because i'm really interested in metabolic engineering of cyanose uh, so I'm curious about the transformation methods. Do you have any data about different types? I've been trying to optimize the protocols that we use in our lab, but I realized that there's a thousand different variables, variables and parameters that can be changed and everyone uses different. And then often in publications, they just mention like, hey, standard, uh, you know, natural transformation or something. And they don't specify. And there's very little um, knowledge, you know, data in literature about the effects of different parameters. So did you ask about these at all in your? Um, we didn't do, I know of basically two different transformation techniques used in, I mean, in Ilka's lab, we have, we use two different actually. Um, so it's uh, electroporation, um, which like you put the plasmid and the cyanobacteria in the same yeah, liquid culture and then put uh, electric energy in there and so it would break up the cells a little bit and then they basically take up naturally take up the um the dna plasmid uh, and the other one is conjugation with a with a tree partite mating system so you have you have your cyanobacterial um uh, white type cell you have uh your e coli which has the trans the plasmid of interest um, also already transformed and you have a third um, organism that's usually also um, an E. coli strain which has like a, a helper plasmid or like a, like a moving plasmid so it basically helps the, the transformed E. coli move the plasmid to the cyanobacteria cell um, but maybe Julie can, can comment on this a little bit more yeah, so, so it, it really depends on what your system is. So you, what you have to make sure is that your transformation method and your construct fit together. Because what Nick was just explaining about conjugation, in order to, to do conjugation, your plasmid that has your cargo gene of interest also needs to be mobilizable. So not all 
uh, the different constructs will work with conjugation because you need that origin of transfer in order to actually open up your plasmid and then get it transferred into your, your cells. Um, the other thing that people do a lot is by natural competence, as you already mentioned. I, I think the luxury that we have is that usually it's quite efficient. Uh, and even if you only get three or four colonies, theoretically, it's enough for you to have a transformant. So I think maybe that's also why there's not so much data in the literature, because usually somehow it works for people. And then uh, wherever you do, there's, there's not that much variation. But you are right that there are a lot of factors that um, influence how efficient uh, your transformation will work. Um, specifically for natural competence, if you think of 7942, for example, they have quite they have a circadian clock. And there's a paper that shows that actually there are certain times uh, in their day-night cycle where it's better to transform, where they are better to take up the DNA than at other times during the day. Uh, but usually it's so efficient that, um, yeah, I, I think we haven't gotten to the point yet that anyone has, has bothered to actually optimize that, that even further. Well, actually some have. Uh, I have found two papers on that and I'm doing a project like besides the iGEM uh, in a research group uh, where we are trying to get hundreds of transformants with one so then optimization would be very crucial. <laughs> and here I've noticed that even incubation times and DNA concentrations, uh, we use natural so we don't use the conjugation or electroporation uh, in our lab at the moment. So then at that point, uh, but yeah, okay. So then if you're only cur interested in getting one uh, single transformant and that, that is enough, then of course it wouldn't matter and anything works. But yeah, okay, I'll so just continue when you looking into you it. Want, when you say you want to get hundreds of transformants, for what reason is that? Are you transforming a library or? Yes, uh, making a, a library, yes. Okay, then. And uh, RBS library, so. Uh, it's it's a project, it's not published, <laughs> but I won't get into it super much in detail now the sun is shining um, after rain, but but yeah, yes, so, so then I mean, it's a completely different story <laughs> than getting just one. It would probably yeah. make sense to, like, uh, to look at um, publications that come out of Susan Golden's lab for 7942. Uh, they've done a lot of work on, on libraries. Um, the only issue is, I don't know to what extent this transfers to 6803. But they really see, and we've tried this in our lab as well, you do really see big differences if you put them into light dark cycles and really transform at the optimal Yeah, time. what was the one you were talking about? What, what should I look up? What was the name? It's 7942, it's Synecococcus elongatus, but if you want, yeah. you can send me an email. I can send you the paper I'm talking about. Okay, that would be really cool. Yeah, <laughs> you just have to send me an email and remind me, otherwise I will forget. <laughs> yeah, I will. Thank you so much. I will give the <laughs> word to someone else. I tried to look it up in the meantime. Um, if I, Is if it I find. It's the paper from uh, Tarton et al. from 2020. Yeah. Uh, I would like to add something here, if that's yeah. fine. So, yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael. I also participated in 2019 in the Argent team of Marburg. Therefore, I have some experience and working with also the UTEX strain. Um, and what I can tell, at least for the PCC7942, where I did my bachelor's on, is that if you linearize any DNA you want to, uh, you want the cyanobacteria to uptake, like the efficiency is at least tenfold higher from what I've at least experienced. So. After doing like the transformation with like one microgram or something, I consistently got, at least for genome integrations, at least hundreds of colonies on the plates. So that worked pretty good. And I think it should be the same as for the 6803, because I think the mechanism should be the same as like a PILUS is uh, responsible for the DNA uptake, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, something to to keep in mind for for DNA for natural competence in DNA uptake, uh, it's usually associated with the with the PLE. So, so there are differences if you use a non-motile or motile strain um, on on taking up the DNA. Um, but yeah, like linearized uh, DNA would make sense because because the PLE structure takes up a linearized DNA fragment basically. Um, so it, it basically it helps the, the natural process already 
take up the, the desired substrate. Yeah. I would like to ask one thing, and yeah. it's about this uh, transformation with linearized DNA. We have seen that some groups have tried to add uh, EDTA to the media, so basically just uh, sequestrate the magnesium ions, and it promotes the transformation because the nucleases from the cell cannot degrade the DNA. I don't know if some of you have tried actually these techniques for improving the efficiency of transformation or, or not. I have actually tried that too. <laughs> I've tried many different things. That's one of the things I tried. I personally did not find any added benefit from it, but then another person in our group did the same thing and he thought it was, you know, beneficial. So then it's again, I just think it's how the stars are aligned <laughs> on the day when you do transformation. <laughs> it's ridiculous how different results you get every time you do it. So yeah, by the way, it's, again, it's not yeah. near replaceable, at least so far. <laughs> we are trying to do it. I mean, it's 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 along the line that Julie just said. It, it makes a really big difference of when you transform the cell. So if you if if you're someone that comes early in the lab, um, and then do the transformation in the morning, so it's like it's the first thing you do, and you want to get rid of it, do the stuff, and then put it in the in the like in the, in the chamber, and that's it. Then they and then it's a really hard time for them to take up their DNA, at least if they're synchronized to like a cycle. Because they're they're more competent during the night, um, so if someone that's like a, that comes in late and does the work in the afternoon and all that stuff, they might be just lucky because their their rhythm of working aligns with the with the natural rhythm of, of cell bacteria. Um, yeah, and it's like you don't you don't you don't really think about it, um, but this might be it could be some kind of reason. <laughs> And and that's it's like I put it in the chat, so that's uh, that's all described in the in the paper by, by Susan Collins. I think that's something that we're really neglecting in general. That we really have to think about more that these organisms also have their own rhythms, and especially if it's for synbio or biotech applications, we just you know crank up the light. You try to make them as grow as fast as possible in continuous light, and I think we're missing quite a lot of tricks there because they do also need their dark periods and. Um, that's something maybe to think about when you when you design your your growth conditions as well. Um, if it wouldn't be better to at least try if if it makes a difference. Yeah, and for for the seven nine for the so it's Nicus coccus elongado seven nine four two. Um, those strains are synchronized to a day night rhythm within a day. So it's like it's really fast. So if you if you if that's a strain and you want to uh, like transform or so it might be interesting if it's not working or it's, i think it's also compared to to other um cynical cocker strains because they have like a, a really fine-tuned clock uh to just bring it to a day night cycle or a day before you do a transformation and then try to transform during the night or like later in the afternoon during the night or so uh that might that might really actually like increase the the transform uh transformation rate of the strain um, but yeah, so, and there are so many, so many factors that then all consider. So if, if you're experienced in the lab, then, then all the stuff you do, you do much faster because you, you know, all the steps. If you start in like with working with, with in the lab for the first time, basically, then every step takes a little bit longer. And, um, if you, if you think about the cells that come from a 30 degrees chamber or 32 or 28, whatever you grow them, then you take them out and put them under the clean bench, under the hood, and put them on the, on the cold metal. So they have like, the complete surface is now, I don't know, 15 degrees or so. Um, so. So if you let them sit there before you do any work with them for 10, 15 minutes, they actually have a cold shock. They're some, in some kind of stress now because their temperature dropped by 15, 20 degrees. So, so their physiology in 15, 20 minutes probably changed so much that they have, don't want to take up DNA or their experiments like they they need to restart all their, their cycle and be happy again if you take they like, put them back. So so this might be sometimes can can cause like differences in your results or so just to have this in mind that that if you get started with, with working with Center Bacteria or in anything in general, that if you if you unexperiences uh, unexperienced your your yeah, your steps take just more time than if you know all the all the work steps and all that stuff. And um, 
and this might this can have an effect i don't know if, if it's a huge effect but it, it can have an effect i see a question by paul yeah it's not really a question i unfortunately have to interrupt here because we're already five minutes over the time aye, aye, aye. Um, but um, maybe we can discuss in the main room whether we change the schedule for today and switch the troubleshooting session with the uh, uh, elevator pitches so that we can make a room like this exact room to continue the, the discussion and other all the other teams can discuss other uh, lab trouble. Um, I mean, could, can you... Ah, okay, I see Re, Re, but is, is Rene, is, is, it, is this you or is it some other, other, other it's, Rene? It's me. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's like, my, I was just thinking, it's like, um, Paul, will, do you want to go to the main room and just leave this room open or will it close automatically? I mean, we could just leave it open, stay here, and then like the organizers discuss if we, if we switch elevator pitch and troubleshooting or, or not. Um, or should we all go to the main room now? It's not my decision. Not <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> my, my neither. <laughs> so, ah, I never did this before. Okay, so uh, I would say we close this for a minute, go to the main room, okay. and then I will reopen it if we reopen it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Cool. Yeah, great, great session. I just, I just copy paste the the, the comment by uh, by Anton and. Uh, we might i might get back to it if we resume the session so it's not lost okay so i will close all the sessions yeah okay Yeah, so I think now everybody is back. Um, we, in the Seattle Bacteria team, happened exactly what we wanted. So we had a really great discussion on uh, transformation methods and cultivation conditions. And the thing is that I think only very few questions were even asked. So in, as I see, there is more time needed in, on this topic. So I personally would suggest that we uh, switch the schedule between ele uh, elevator pitches and um, uh, a troubleshooting session because uh, that might, so that might, uh, might be reasonable. So I will just uh, show the schedule again. I mean, we are also, I know, I think 15 minutes behind the schedule, but uh, no, that's, that's not the, where's my presentation? Ah, here's my presentation, okay. Um, so that... Um, ah. What's going on? Okay, here. So we are... I mean... We are 20, 20 minutes behind the... Yeah. Uh, so, so we, we could, could uh, switch troubleshooting and elevator pitches, um, make another 20 minutes at least. Um, yeah, how does that sound to the other organizers and those who wanted to prepare an elevator pitch? Um, I would just continue with the plan, but uh, if you guys think that uh, we should do the troubleshooting now, it's not so fine. Maybe we can also quickly check how many elevator pitches there would be, if it's yeah. that much. Okay, yeah. maybe everybody who is has yeah. prepared an elevator pitch can raise the hand. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, okay if we make five minutes elevator pitch and five two, minutes Q&A, that's already one hour. Four, five, um, six. I don't know whether we want to Nicholas and uh, Julia wait so long. Uh, yeah, six elevator pitches. So perhaps half now. Yeah. So perhaps it would be better to continue with the troubleshooting. Okay. 
And those who don't have troubles to shoot can maybe come back in 20 minutes. Or just listen <laughs> listen the, this, uh, to the interesting cyanobacteria uh, transformation discussion. So I will reopen the, um, uh, the, the breakout sessions. And we had 20 minutes scheduled for the troubleshooting, so in 20 minutes we meet again here. Yeah. And this time I will be more on time. I think the, the, the RG people were, um, were done, or I think there's no more discussion, but like I think it would be enough to have still have a two and higher by this time. Okay. Um, so I will kick the early session. And only have open higher plants as yeah, energy. Wait. All right. Um, so I still see the the comment by uh, by Anton. Um, I think it's just a comment and a question, right? And basically, just like they need they need also different bacteria in the culture uh, for transforming the the spirulina uh, strains. Yeah, it's like something that that is you also have in mind is like cyanobacteria, not cyanobacteria. It's like we have filamentous ones. We have single cell, we have like a few colonies. We have, they can have different, uh, like they, they also can have structural differences in their filaments. They have uh, cell differentiation. So it's like, it's not that every cell has the same program. There's like heterocysts and normal vegetative cells that say like this. Um, and, and, I mean, they grow in in polar regions where it's like minus 20, 30 degrees. They still grow there or or maintain their their uh, their life in the polar regions. But they also can grow in uh, in hydrothermal vents at like 70, 80 degree, degrees plus. So it's like a huge range of temperatures, altitudes. They live in 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 um, in salt water oceans, but also on in like yeah, deserts basically, they grow on, on land where it's super dry and there's nothing really. So, um, as like for, for example, Atrospira, I think if, if I remember correctly, it's like a salt water strain and it's high salt tolerant. Um, so that's completely different from any freshwater cyanobacterium like Synecococcus. Um, and I think Atrospira is also filamentous, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, I I'm not sure. Mary Julie, do you know that? It's like how to transform Nostoc. We, I think we did this once where we basically use sonication to break the filaments into single cells. So we so we made like a, from the Nostoc filaments, we just like try to like rip them apart to single cells and then transform them. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I mean, I can send you some overviews of how you can transform what cyanobacteria, but to be very honest with you, I mean, if you have, you're going to go for these model cyanobacteria any, anyway, because you try to engineer them, I, I assume. Um, and quite often, I think natural competence, the problem is there's a lot of factors that you don't have that much control over. So reproducibility might be an issue, as we said, that for one person in the same lab, it works differently than for the other, right? Um, I think with conjugation, it's probably easier to get that variation under control. Um, and you can you can use plasmids actually that um, will have a, an origin of repl replication that will not work in your cyanobacteria. So even if you want to integrate it into the genome, 
you can use conjugation. It's not only these really huge self-replicating plasmids that, that work with conjugation. So if you're struggling to get enough colonies, maybe it would be an idea to try and try and use conjugation to just change your backbone that, that is compatible with it. In the worst case, you have to clean it up because you didn't get rid of your E. coli is properly after conjugation, but that, that's sort of the major limitation of that method, I would say. But getting colonies, usually you get even whole lawns and you have to, to, um, to carefully, uh, yeah, you know, plate dilutions to get single colonies. So maybe that would be something you would want to have if you want to make a library. Can I ask like what, what sort of strange people are working with? Yeah, well, I'm working with Synergo SP PCC6803. The classic. Yeah, the very classic one, <laughs> the uh, most are you, common. Are you, work, are you from Turku? Yes. Okay, cool. Are you working in, in uh, Yagu's group or do you work with Eva? I work with Pauli Kallio, so that oh, was okay. Eva Mariaro. Oh, okay. uh, so she gave me a grant <laughs> for the summer, yeah. then I did my train, lab training last nice. like, November, nice. too. Uh, yeah, April. Cool. That's actually great. I also took a couple of courses with Jack when I was there by Erasmus. <laughs> and regarding the strain, here in Madrid we're trying to work with Sinecococcus elongatus PCC 11801. This recently discovered in India, but actually we're still struggling with the Nagoya protocol and all the tramits. So hopefully somewhere in mid-July or August we can solve everything and we can request the strain to the Pasteur collection. But so far, if we cannot get the strain, we will start working with PCC 17942 because the other one, the marine strain in PCC 11901, is currently under fungal contamination. So we cannot neither use that one. So let's see what happens. <laughs> did you receive that from the PCC collection or did you get it from the UTEX collection? The 11901? No, actually, we're still waiting for it. We are waiting to the Indian government, the National Biodiversity Authority, to give us the permission to ask the Pasteur culture collection for the strain. Because Pasteur collection is closer to Spain, it's in Paris, so we hope that will be faster than the UTEX. Okay. From the UTEX culture collection, sometimes things also come in kind of weird stages. You might have to be careful and check for contamination as well. I don't know what they do with the strains there. <laughs> we will take the, the advice. <laughs> Anyone uh, working the, some the other things? Uh, the atrospira is not very popular uh, for the same bacterial uh, symbio work, I suppose. Does anyone does anyone here work with atrospira uh, strains? I I think I know some people in Belgium uh, that actually work with atrospira and try to like like send this to the ISS and, and have this like in their, in their like system there. But I think they have like really problems working with Atospira also to transform them and all that stuff because it's apparently much harder than, uh, than the lab strain in cyanobacteria. But... Um, and it's like really important that we try, right? Yeah, yeah. Ilka, Ilka mentioned that because, I mean, obviously spirulina, uh, there's so much going on with spirulina. So if we were able to transform that strain, that would be like really a major a breakthrough if we get consistent methods for that. So I think it's really good that you try to maybe not also go for, let's, let's say, the easy options with the cyanobacteria. Yeah. I mean, the cool thing is with Atospira, it's, it's the, so to my knowledge at least, it's the only... Um, standard bacterial strain that is allowed for food consumption. Yeah, um, it's really recognized as safe. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I don't know the history about how how like Atospira or Spirulina got this status because there are so many standard bacteria that are non toxic and they could have the same. I think it's just like someone needs to go to regulations and basically have the other strains assigned to, as as like able to eat. But since we have this one strain. It would be really cool to have more tools for the strain because then you can actually do something with it and still have the status of it's it's safe to eat. Um, but yeah, so great great work. Keep keep up with us. Well, we Someone is also working with a with a two nine seven three strain. Who who is that? How are you trying to transform it? Uh, it it's me. Uh, we are doing a triparental conjugation uh, to transform them. So. I'm trying to do this uh, right now, like uh, 
I finished the cloning last week, so uh, I will try to do the conjugation next week, and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> okay, good luck, but it should be working. I mean, for us, it works very well, So, but there's very mixed reports about that, so that's why I asked, and I was curious how other people you know, try to use it. Cool. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, what is the principle of the conjugation method? Method. I think we haven't stumbled upon it in our research. Should, should I say that? Yeah, you probably know more about it than I do. <laughs> well, it's you know how Acrobacterium transformation works with plants. Essentially, it's the same system. Essentially, what you need is a type one secretion. So it's it's also a pilus that is formed between the cells. You know how in E. coli the the system of this F minus pilus. Where you can transfer a plasmid from an uh, from an F plus to an F minus cell, which goes through through this pilus that is formed, and then basically through this relaxosome, your plasmid will be made single stranded, and then you can thread it through that pilus into the other cell. And you need all these helper genes in order to mobilize your plasmid. It's exactly the same system. This is why you need this helper plasmid that will have all the genes to mobilize your your um, your plasmid from your, your cargo strain to be then threaded into your cyanobacterial cells. So it doesn't only work between cells of the same species, as we see also with plants, because it goes from microbacterium into plants, it also works between E. coli and, uh, and the cyanos for us. So yeah, it's just um, yeah through, through these uh, type 4 pili as well, just different types of type 4 pili. <laughs> Is that enough explanation? Okay. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. Let's see. yeah, it just it just means that you have to make sure that you 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 need your helper strain, you need um, the elements on your plasmid that will allow you to transfer the the plasmid into your um, into your cyanobacterium, and in the end you need to grow all of them up and you need to put them together nicely. So you want to tuck them in closely together in close physical contact so that these pili yeah. can form. So when you when the actual conjugation is supposed to happen. You need to make sure that you handle them carefully because otherwise you shear off these pili and then it won't work very well. So as soon as you mix them, you really want to want to treat them very gently that they can uh, perform that event of conjugation and you don't destroy that um, that transfer of DNA. Yeah, that sounds, sounds fragile. Yeah, and uh, it's is not the that fragile. Way... Actually, this is how people used to characterize parts of uh, whole bacterial genomes of how they get transferred by shearing off these pili and then checking what's in there. So <laughs> but that's very old school. So I don't, I don't mm -hmm. do that anymore. Yeah. And is the E. coli the uh, usual helper strain process? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Do you want to repeat your question, maybe? Sorry, have you heard me? Oh, so, sorry, um, sorry. I think, that's, so I think you were. Fully... I think you were frozen yeah, for yeah. for a second. Maybe. Uh, like, what are the helper strains of bacteria that are used uh, in this method? Uh, usually, it's a, it's a standard helper strain that will have plasmids that actually have been published like in the 90s or something it's very old and uh, sometimes you you just you you need these general elements of these mob genes I'm, I'm thinking of i can find some slides to explain this better and sometimes what you can do is you can add additional um, layers of helper uh, plasmid for example to methylate your dna and it's more stable and doesn't get degraded so easily uh, but generally, there's like two or three main standard helper plasmids that are used and that the community uses all the time. Um, and and it, it works. So I think that's why it hasn't really been changed. And there There is a paper where they try to actually optimize that process to make it easier, mainly for you, and to improve efficiency. So there's a paper where they, they, they changed some of these elements, they, they put some mutations that it's easier for cloning, because why often these are big plasmids, and because they have this origin of transfer, sometimes it gets nicked. Um, also, when you just you try to you know, amplify your, your plasmid in E. coli, and then that leads to your lower yield in your DNA preparations or something, and that's something you don't want. So they put some mutations in to help you with the cloning process, and they also put some mutations in to make the transfer more efficient. Actually, I can maybe try to find that paper in a second if you if you're interested. Actually, I had some. Oh, sorry. Uh, I had some questions about the strains that are used for the conjugal uh, 
E. coli in the helper E. coli. Uh, in the papers that I found, I saw that many used uh, E. coli HB101 as the strain for the base. And I was wondering if that was really important or if just using the classical plasmid for helper and conjugal functions uh, and you could use uh, any E. coli or I don't know if you know. I'm not sure if you can use any E. coli. I think there's a reason why everyone uses the same strain and they might have to do with, you know, what, what's the genotype of that strain itself. So I wouldn't experiment around with that. I wouldn't try to use just DH5 alpha where the plasmids stick to that strain as it is, uh, DHP on a one with those specific plasmids because that's what works. So you don't want to change that. Okay. I can confirm this. So um, that there is some genotype difference in, in the E. coli strains, whereas only the HP101 and I'm, I'm not sure about other strains, but at least this is compatible with it, whereas like top 10 or something would not be compatible for uh, conjugation. So but this needs to be there. And yeah, during 2019 in our project, we, we also tried some other plasmids for the conjugation, which didn't require like I'm actually not sure if you are familiar with the uh, uh, protocols at the moment, but it sort of like combine, uh, combined the helper plasmid with like the, the transfer plasmid or something. Uh, uh, it was called PRK2013 or something. So this would then only require like one uh, E. coli strain, if I remember correctly or something. Yeah. Okay, as the time is running out again, we only have two minutes left. I would suggest that we open a channel in our Slack workspace so that you can all, I mean, I have nothing to do with standard bacteria, but you uh, can discuss there all the things and also maybe on Twitter with uh, all the uh, standard bacteria community. That's a great offer that we can use your network, uh, Nick. Yeah, just um, just one. Uh, here's a link for for Anton. That's the people in in Belgium that working on the on the Melissa projects, like the life support system on the ISS where they use spirulina. If you might want to contact uh, Felice, uh, that's a Mastro Leo, I think it's last name. It's it's also in the under the link. You, you see the name, um, and maybe maybe they can help you with um, with transforming Arthur Spira. I'm not sure if they succeeded with that so far but it may be like, like good contact to just like because they're working with Arthur Spear for so long uh, and no and no stuff it might be a, a good idea yeah sure thank you so much I also posted a link to that conjugation paper I mentioned actually if you read the introduction they explain quite well what these individual elements do so maybe it's worth checking that out and if you open a Slack channel um, for, for that, I, I'll join as well. As I joined your Slack channel, so I can also yeah. answer some questions later on. Just show a QR code in case that you want to join the, the Slack workspace. So, uh, yeah, uh, there we will try to organize all this stuff. And uh, hopefully also this discussion on these topics brings a bit life into our Slack workspace. Yeah, yeah, great, great initiative, great work. Um, it's it's really good to have that for all the teams. I think like, for those that do engineering, that we have one talk by, by Julie actually on, on uh, some bio and, and cyanobacteria on the YouTube channel and from Maria. She's like a postdoc in the US currently, but she's from, from Spain. She has so many, there are so many references and, and papers in there in her talk about metabolic engineering of cyanobacteria. So, uh, if you're still looking for for getting started with this, that might be like really good resource. To just get get started, and like she's really uh, responsive. So I, I guess you can also contact her if you have any questions. Okay, uh, then I would thank you both, Julia and uh, Nicolas, uh, for being here and providing all all the answers and insights. That was really great, and um, yeah. Maybe we come back to you, Nick, for uh, uh, standardization stuff on the next uh, talk.
Topics. Yeah, what, whatever you need. Whenever I can, like we can do something for you, just let us know. We want to uh, see cyanobacteria thrive, so that's yeah, yeah. It's like we have we have general interest in in the, in the iGEM teams to to work on cyanobacteria, and then we just we would wherever we can help, we just we're happy to do it because um, I think everyone benefits from it. Yeah. Um, okay. That was a great final word for this session. So I will uh, end this session and see you all back in the uh, main session. And uh, yeah, so see you. Great, thank you. see that the higher plants are in their session still, but I think they will join because in 30 seconds all the sessions are over. So, uh, but it's mainly two people and then be a little amount of people. Okay. I think everybody's back now. Um, so we can continue with the original plan of the animated pictures. Um, unfortunately, we didn't prepare an order because we were not sure which team will prepare one, so we didn't prepare an order. Um, so maybe volunteers yes, first? Uh, we as the hosts should start, so either uh, Elliot yeah. or Marber. I would be willing to start if that's fine for you. Go for it. Yeah. So obviously our first uh, talk will be by Jonas from the IPGM Marburg team. And um, yeah, I think it's like three to five minutes and then up to five minutes Q&A. Yes. I'm going to share my screen first. I hope I will be in.